the addiction, mm. alcohol, and treating it. You know, I know we're both fans of Dr. Gabor Mate. Oh. I know you spoke to Gabor recently on your show, as, as I did. And, you know, this idea that that's an attempt at the solution, isn't it? That's, you know, the problem may not necessarily be the alcohol. The alcohol is an attempt to kind of mm. solve the problem, solve the underlying problem. Mm. And it, maybe it's a failed attempt, but at least it might, in the short term at least, work. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because I'm now five years sober. Uh, Congratulations. And, thank you. And and that time, and I would call myself an alcoholic. And still I know, today. Still today, yeah. I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink for over five years, but I'm still very much an alcoholic. That is because my brain is sort of, I guess, I would say wired that way. Now, obviously, Gabor Mate has different sort of theories on that. Although I, I agree with him on the kind of that it's a trauma based response. But um, but what I've realised with the word alcoholism, because there's a lot of stigma around that as well and a lot of misunderstanding of what it is. I mean, I thought alcoholism was a man on a park bench sipping from a paper bag. And of course it is that, mm. but it's lots of other... I was like, I can't be an alcoholic because I do reformer Pilates. I run marathons. I have a mortgage, a job, a lovely child, a wonderful husband. I get up and I go to work. There were all sorts of reasons I couldn't be an alcoholic. But eventually... It was, and I, I would spend a lot of time trying to prove I wasn't one. And eventually I was like, actually, it's just easier now to accept mm. that I am one. But alcohol, in a way, the alcohol bit of uh, the word alcoholism is, I always think is a bit, it's, it's a bit of a red herring because I could blame everything on the alcohol. And when I was, went to get sober, I was like, oh, great. Now I'm putting down alcohol. My life will be brilliant, you know, and I won't suffer from any of these things. But of course, I suffered from them before I ever picked up a drink. Mm. And for me, it's like I'm lucky enough, and I've kind of jumped way ahead here. So, uh, but I'm lucky enough to that because of the way I destructively drank to know that I am I have the ism, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, the I self me. Yeah. Um, but I am still as mad as a hatter even without a drink, especially without a drink. You know, alcohol for me, Rongo, was like a real. You know, I, I'm grateful for it because I don't know how else I would have got through life because no one else, there weren't any other options mm. of treatment out there for me. So it played a role. It played a, it played a, it played a helpful role potentially. Would you go that far? I would say, yeah. I would say that, I mean, I'm lucky. I sometimes think when I think of where my drinking and drugging took me that I'm lucky to be alive. But I also think that without it, would I have, would I you know, what would I have done? Like I need, I was in a lot of pain. I thought I might be a serial killing pedophile, you yeah. know? Um, I was, I, I thought I was dying of a terrible illness or that I had the power somehow to kill people, you know, with my thoughts. So alcohol was like, it was like putting on a sparkly dress, yeah. you know, like, oh, thank God for that moment, for even if it was only for five minutes. Do you remember when you started drinking? Yeah, I was 14. And I, I mean, from the get go, drank alcoholically. So I remember me and my friend Emma, we went to the off license and somehow we bought a like a litre bottle of vodka, uh, a vodka and a litre bottle of, no, maybe not a litre, sorry, a litre bottle of cider. It's a lot yeah. of alcohol. And then like a bottle of vodka, like a, I don't know what the measurement was, but I drank it all like almost all of it immediately and of course was immediately very unwell very sick and my friend's mum had to come yeah. and pick me up and put me in a bath uh and you would have thought from, from that experience that I'd be like maybe alcohol's not for me but I was back out the next weekend doing the same thing but maybe it was sort of slight like learning to quote-unquote pace myself yeah well it's interesting Bryony as I think about that You've got these intrusive thoughts, right? You, you're you struggling to cope with them. You don't like the way it makes you feel. And at the age of 14, you start drinking. Now, were you, it, it, you know, now on reflection, having done a lot of inner work and therapy, mm. it's it's clear that alcohol served a role. Mm. It was helping, I guess, numb various things that you didn't like experiencing. Mm. 
Did you know that in the moment? You know, were you, do you know when you became conscious, oh, this is helping me? Because many 14-year-olds, I guess, certainly in the UK, will have experiences of being introduced to alcohol by their friends or their schoolmates and go to the park at the weekends and start drinking. And I don't know, did, were you aware it was doing something for you? I don't think I was, I, I don't think I was, con I, you know, it was a long time before I made the link between, yeah. a, a, I mean, bear in mind that at 14, I didn't even know I had OCD. You know, yeah, I didn't course. even know it existed as a thing. So these are just things inside your head so that yeah. you were sort of dealing with yourself. Yeah. And I, but I just knew that what I knew was, and I think this is a very British thing, is that in the evening, people sat down and went, <sighs> with a glass of wine. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's that's the way we deal with our problems, you know. That's certainly what I'd been modelled. Now, neither of my parents are alcoholics, you know. They were very much, they'd like a nice glass of red and that was it. But I I knew that that was, it was like an escape in a way, if that makes sense, yeah. from life. For your parents. Yeah, and I think certainly it was, yeah, what I, it, it was sort of, what I'd learned culturally as well. I'd, we'd watch EastEnders. People would go down the Queen Vic and have a pint, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, and they'd talk about their troubles. Yeah. It was very much how society in the UK certainly is yeah. sort of set up. Now, there's, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing per se wrong with that, yeah. you know. I am not anti-alcohol, you know. It doesn't work for me. I can't have it. But I don't mind people, I don't, you know, I don't mind people drinking around me. In fact, it reminds me of why I can't drink because people have like one drink and I'll go, I cannot think of anything worse than one drink. Like if you said to me, oh, I've discovered this new pill and it's going to make you drink moderately, I'd be like, no thanks, don't want it. Because if I pick up a drink today, I want oblivion, you know. But lots of people can drink moderately yeah. and health and, and and they enjoy the taste and they it they it complements. So I I'm not, you know, and I think it's important we need ways to come together. Yeah. Although, you know, it's really interesting. I think a lot of people can do that for sure. But if we look back to you in your twenties, let's say, mm. or thirties, or you know, whenever, outwardly, you were managing, right? You yeah. had a good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a journalist, you're an author, you yeah. know, like you're 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 succeeding at life, certainly yeah. by societal metrics, yeah. yet you've got this alcohol problem yeah. in the background, right? So I kind of feel a lot of people, just to be clear, I have no moral issue with alcohol, right? Yeah. I get it. Some people can drink now and again in for enjoyment, maybe to help them bond with their friends or whatever it might be. But I think more people. I think there's a lot more people with a problem with alcohol than they might think. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not anti-alcohol, but I'm anti us not acknowledging that for some people it is really problematic. And that thing, as you said as well, like all of our views of alcoholism, you know, all of my views of alcoholism in my 20s and most of my 30s they kept me in alcoholism because i i couldn't because the, as you say the metrics of success when i when i ended up in rehab at my absolute lowest ebb i was the most successful i have ever been in my career so it was 2017 and i had broken this huge story prince harry had come to you know he'd come on my podcast and he'd spoken about having a breakdown when his mother you know after his mother died and the effects of ignoring all of that. I had just, re I'd, re I'd run the London Marathon for Heads Together and raised like £60,000. I'd won, when I was 60 days clean and sober, I had to be allowed out of rehab to go to the Mind Media Awards to receive the Making a Difference Award that was handed to me by like Stephen Fry. Wow. It was complete, and my brain was going, whoa. And you know, part of that was because I'd been so honest. I'd been so honest about my OCD. And it was only really in being honest about my OCD the year before in my book Mad Girl, which also that year had gone to number one in the Sunday Times bestsellers chart. And I'm, I, I sound like I'm sort of like, oh, look at me, look at me. But the truth was behind it was that I couldn't deal with it. And in a way, I think I, I had to get that successful to kind of realize it was like, you're going to lose all of this. Because you, these, two, these two things, well, maybe they are 
only compatible. Maybe I can only live like that, which is desperately trying to be the best and for people to, you know, please like me, please like me. I'm, you know, mm. buy my books, do all of this. Um, uh, when I'm, when I was drinking and drugging, I don't know, like, but yeah, outwardly I, mean, I was, I was killing it, you know, but actually inwardly I was on the verge of dying. I guess if we think about people in the public eye, mm. it's actually not that uncommon. Like it's, it's, you know, we, we were sharing over a coffee just before we started, you know, your experience as a journalist for many years and having met many successful people, mm -hmm. right? You've, you've learned a lot. Yeah. I mean, the thing, I mean, one doesn't want to generalise too much, but let me generalise. <laughs> Almost every super, quote unquote, successful person that I've interviewed, that success comes from a desperate need to fill a hole. And I don't know what caused that hole in their soul. You know, the hole in the soul, that's what yeah, we call it. A... Um, it's about validating because they don't have the sort of self-esteem in themselves to, to be that person. And there's, there's all sorts of perfectly, and that isn't to do it down, you know, most people who are happy in themselves don't need to work kind of like 14 hour days, yeah. not sleep, um, you know, like, and I think this is a really important conversation to have about what we deem success, you know, because if you think of like, okay, so a massive metric for success is wealth, right? So like the richest man on the planet, Elon Musk, but I don't know if anyone's watched the Elon Musk show on, on the BBC, in which you learn that this is a deeply unhappy man who never sees his family. He 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 gives up, you know, he gets rid of one wife, replaces her with another, barely sees them, doesn't see the kids, you know, has a really unhappy childhood. And to me, and you know, I was thought to myself, when does Elon Musk get to enjoy this? Yeah. For him, the enjoyment is, I suppose, the process of conquering the world in itself, you know. But or, or is it? I don't know how happy he is because there's also all this footage of him saying, I don't think you'd want to be me. Yeah. There's a, there's a much wider point there for me, which I think is, I think it's so, so important, Bryony. Like addictions, right? Okay. You, 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 you know, you talk about the kind of conventional view of the alcoholic, the man on the park bench, you know, can't get their life together. And you just demonstrated how... Uh, clearly, that's a very one-sided view of addiction. But there's also this kind of wider point in society today in the 21st century, now in 2022, where I think that most of us have an addiction to something mm -hmm. of some sort. And then there's actually this thing where some addictions are actually sanctioned, mm -hmm. legally sanctioned, that's okay, but also celebrated by society and I think work. Work addiction. Work addiction is a big one. It's, you know, what do you say? Oh, they've got a great work ethic. Yeah. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's just take a step back. At what cost is that work ethic coming? Mm. And and I think, I mean, I touched on this in my last book on happiness, Bryony, but I'm gonna I'm 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 writing my next one at the moment and I'm I'm really gonna expand this whole idea because I think we're worshipping the wrong people in society. And I think social media makes us worse. We look up to these people. We think we want their life, mm. but we don't know their life. No. We don't know the cost that they're paying. We we might see someone on social who's posting three times a day and they're killing it with content. I think, oh man, you know, I want to be that successful. But you don't know that. Mm. You don't know what are their relationships like. Do they see their children? Do they have a partner? Mm. Do they want a partner? You know, do they get any time off? Like, I think it's a real problem. I guess I'm passionate about it because I have I feel I've fallen into that trap mm. before. And I feel very much now that the people I want to look up to and people that I want to look up to as role models are the people who, oh, you know, oh, they've got a great relationship with a partner and their kids and they're doing something great at work. Mm. You know, do you know what I mean? I don't know. Absolutely. It's... I it's the problem with social media is that, I mean, there's so many things there, right? So addiction, you see, we are, and also I think a lot of society runs off 
addictive processes. So work, food, but also the phones that we are all hooked mm. on. Like they are designed specific, and so are social media apps. They are designed specifically yeah. to addict you. I mean, that's how they work, right? And we know that the the likes and the shares and the clicks, they work on the same dopamine receptors that cocaine does, okay? So like I have genuinely, and I was, I don't, I'm, I don't know if I've said this before, I don't think I've said this before, but I think the first few years of my sobriety, what kept me sober was an addiction to validation. I was so addicted. I was so used. People were telling me, you're amazing. Well done. You've told, you've, you've, you know, you've been so honest. We love you. Look, you run a marathon in your pants. Aren't you amazing? You're helping us all. And it, obviously that makes me feel good, right? And that's great when it's happening, but like, you can't live life like that the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I found myself about a year ago, um, when you get a blue tick, Blue ticks are sort of in the news at the moment, aren't they, a lot? Yeah. Um, when you get a blue tick on Instagram, you can sort of really see uh, your sort of data. You know, so how many people are following you, how many people are unfollowing you, right? And I, I start to really obsessively look at that. Like several times a day, I was like, oh my God, my following count's gone down or my follower count's gone up or, oh my God, people clearly don't like what I've said because that's gone, you know, like I have, I'm, I was basically living my life according to the algorithm, right? And then I get told, you need to do reels. You need to do reels. Reels are the thing, you know? And uh, I'm like, I'll do a reel. And then I hemorrhage followers every time I do reels because I realized the people that are following me, they don't want to watch reels, okay? They're not interested in it. That's not why they were there. But I found myself, I got to this like, bottoming out point earlier this year for various reasons where I was like, oh my God, I am literally letting an algorithm dictate my life and to dictate what I do. And I was, what my brain was doing in that very addicty way was like, you get followers, you good. You lose followers, you bad. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, that was it. You know, you're over, your career's done. And I was like, I can't live like this. Also, as someone who calls themselves a mental health campaigner, I had to look back and go, I had to step back and go, is it morally responsible for me to use Instagram or social media generally um, to convey messages about mental health when the, when the platforms in themselves are capable, I can see this, of like screwing around, you know, they are designed to screw around with our mental health, essentially. And I've had to really step back from it. And I, you know, I deleted my Twitter account long ago. Um, and, I, you know, I'm still on Instagram, but I've I've kind of had to go, whoa, it does, you know, this isn't you. You are not your Instagram account, you know? Yeah. This whole idea of living your life by an algorithm is it's really interesting because I observe what's been said in the public kind of the, the public conversation around this, a lot of people say this is what's great about these um, these platforms. You can test what works, right? Mm. You see what works, you can give it more of it. I'm like, no, 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 no. Why is that a good thing, mm. right? What you're effectively saying is, I am prepared to change who I am <laughs> and what I put out in the world to feed this algorithm. Absolutely. That is a problem when I have found just in my day-to-day -day using of social media and sometimes I think oh is this a is this a bit of a like a privileged problem but I do think you're right in that we all have social media and we all have followings and followers and um, um we all have uh, yeah we all follow people and I um realized that the more I I look at people um, what they're doing and go, I, I, I can, my brain naturally clicks into this. Oh, I should, oh, why, why aren't you doing that, Bryony? Why aren't you? And that can be, why aren't you on holiday to why aren't you professionally writing yeah. this book or whatever? You know, it can be anything. It can be, you know, oh, why don't you do that? Why don't you parent like that? Or <laughs> why don't you cook those meals every night? You know, it's, it's all comparison, 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 comparison. And the more I do that, the less I tune into what I can actually do. And that's, you know, again, it is the people pleasing. But also the algorithm reminds me a bit of this like really abusive boyfriend I had in my early 20s, which was like, if I did what he wanted, he was nice to me. But if I didn't and went my own way, I was ghosted. Yeah. 
And that's kind of, you know, and that's some sometimes you hit it that you happen to be in tune with the algorithm, you know, and that's great. And then, you know, and you're getting thousands of followers a day or whatever. And everyone's going, woohoo, you're great. And then, but everything changes. I think it is, this is beyond social media. It's like, when are you changing who you are? for the validation of other people, right? Someone may listen to this and go, well, I don't have that problem on Instagram. Okay, fine. But they may have it in another part of their life. Yeah, yeah, do yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? They might have it at the school gate. They might have it- <laughs> They probably do. In their volunteer the group. Gate. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, so- Or it's, in the office, or just, you know, in, in the house. And there's, there's actually a really powerful bit in in, in your book, Bryony, where I think you you spoke about this author. You described her as a this beautiful author that you follow on Instagram. And normally, usually the content makes you feel good. But if you're not in the, the best place that yeah. you could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. suddenly that same content <laughs> is making you feel really, really bad. Well, it's all about me. You know, it's not, it's never to do with the yeah. person that I'm comparing to. That's the other thing I've learned is like, if I'm feeling discomfort inside me, I, 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 you know, I it's very easy. The easiest thing is to go. It's their fault, but it's something. It's something in me, you know. And it's like, are you okay? Because when I'm in a good place, I I'm just like, wow, isn't that great? Yeah, they're doing exactly. this thing, you know. We're, or oh, I'm so happy for that person. But when I'm not in a good place, I can I can get into sort of seething resentment because yeah. I'm a human being. Yeah. Tell me about that moment that I've heard you say once before. When you had this realization that I think, I mean, and please tell it in your own words, I, I, I think that you felt you were okay with alcohol or you could balance it in your life. <laughs> and I've never forgotten this as I heard you say it. You said, I, I used to say that my daughter was the most important thing in my life. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it was actually alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite hard to, yeah. Um, I mean, it was. I I would tell myself, you know, alcoholism, addiction. It's a it's a, it's an illness of denial. You know, I think this in general with most mental illnesses, and I do class addiction as a kind of a mental illness. Is that they kind of they're they're the only illnesses that tell you you don't have them. You know, that's one of the symptoms. They sort of you gaslight mm -hmm. yourself, right? And and that's how they thrive. You know, the, the the thing all mental illnesses have in common is that they lie to you and they tell you you're a freak and they tell yeah. you that you're alone and they tell you that no one's going to understand what you're going through. And we know that's not true. Um, But I, I told myself I couldn't be an alcoholic and I told myself that alcohol was like, it made me fun. It allowed me, I mean, I was a party girl in my 20s and 30s. Well, that's what I called myself. I was an alcoholic in my 20s and 30s. But I was, I could tell myself by cultural, um, you know, norms, I was a party girl. Mm. You know, I was a fun time girl. I surrounded myself with people that drank much like me. And when I got pregnant, it didn't, it genuinely, genuinely wrong, it didn't occur to me that at the end of the pregnancy, I would do anything other than sip a sophisticated glass of red wine once in a while. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just thought, oh, this is this pregnancy, this is going to do for me what I guess rehab and the 12 steps do for <laughs> lots of other people, you know. It's going to force you to stop. Yeah, yeah. I just thought that's going to force me to stop. Um, it just didn't even cross my mind while I was pregnant. I had no yearning for alcohol. Um, probably because I was eating so much food, you know, it was like I'd replace one addiction with another. But uh, I, I remember two weeks after my daughter was born, I went to the pub and I was like blackout drunk. And six weeks after she was born, I was scrabbling around scoring cocaine. Um, and I remember like... It was like there was this kind of split in my body from my brain all the way down of like, it was like a shock. I was like, oh, wow. Wow. This is exactly what you were like before your daughter was born, before you got pregnant. 
this there's this beautiful beautiful little thing at home asleep being looked after by her dad and you can't stop behaving like this even for her and that was like it was like a rupture it was horrific you know like how do you how do you square that with yourself the shame was huge and so I think, you know, brain goes into like denial in a way. It's like a protective mechanism, isn't it? And I was like, oh, well, I need to. So these were like some of the lies I told myself. I need to be, you know, I happy, you know, if I go out and have the odd drink and mm. maybe the odd line once every three months or whatever, um, I'll be, uh, you know, I'll be a happy, go lucky, relaxed mom and happy mom, happy baby. You know, I told myself all this bullshit. And, you know, I could also, I could also sort of, I could also tell myself because I didn't drink every day, I had all these rules around my drinking. So I didn't drink every day, I drank every other day. Um, I would wait till my daughter was asleep, you know. I When I woke up in the morning, I was always full of shame and I was like I'm never going to drink again I'm never going to drink again again and again and again until it got to like 4 p.m and then I'd be like maybe I'll have a drink tonight mm. but I was like alcoholics don't wake up in the morning and not want to drink alcoholics wake up and pick up a drink and mm. I'd never done that right and um I always remember someone when I turned up at rehab saying not yet not yet for I need <laughs> but give it time. If you carry on like this, you will be picking up a drink. It's a progressive illness, right? And, um, but anyway, I, I I had all these rules and I thought because I had all these rules, I was in control of my alcohol, my drinking, but really it was in control of me because even though I wasn't drinking every day, I was thinking about drinking every day. Mm -hmm. It ruled my life. So like if I had a work meeting on a Tuesday morning, that meant I couldn't drink on the Monday night. So obviously I would have to drink on the Sunday night. It didn't mean I didn't drink on the Monday night, but so it was like, it, it controlled everything. And yeah, to my shame, I spent a lot more time thinking about alcohol than my daughter. You mentioned that that moment when your daughter was maybe six weeks old or, you know, in the first few months of her life where you had to drink and you had to go and score a line of Coke. Mm -hmm. Now, for people who are listening mm -hmm. or watching this who have got no experience with addiction, no experience or, or knowledge of cocaine addiction mm -hmm. and who might be judging you yeah. right now, what would you say to them? Oh, that's totally cool. They can judge me, you know. Um, I I hope that they never have to get any knowledge of addiction or cocaine addiction. Like, that's so cool. If they're judging me, that's, you know, that's their stuff, not mine. Um, I would sort of lovingly explain that um, I think that if we don't talk honestly about this stuff, we can't ever hope to help people who suffer yeah. from it. So when I talk... When I talk openly about this, I, I've, you know, I get a lot of, you know, I, I see a lot of feedback that's like, why are you doing this? You're an absolute mess. Your daughter might one day read this. How? Because, you know, I was graphic about the, the way that I ended up having to get sober, you know, bad shit happened. You know, it was really dark, really, really dark, you know. And all I could say to that is that like, there are, I know now from going into recovery, I used to think I was the worst mum in the world. I used to think I was the only mum in the world that behaved like that. Well, parent, you know, because let's not, let's not, <laughs> let's not keep it to, 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 to women. But um, it was, I was so ashamed. And I remember going into rehab. I'm so lucky to be able to go into rehab. And the first person I met was this other woman who's like the same age as me. And she had a kid the same age as me and she lived like a mile down the road. And we had the same sobriety date, August the 27th, August the 26th, 2017. And I was like, oh my God, you were there all along. I wasn't I wasn't the only one behaving like this. And the relief, Holly and I are best friends to this day, you know. And I, I meet women all the time, 
you know, who are desperately trying to fight yeah. this illness because they love their kids, yeah. you know. And that's the thing about addiction is that it's like, it's so powerful. It's so powerful that it will destroy love. You know, it really will. And so the reason that I have been so honest about what happened in those last days, years of my drinking and using is because um, I know that there are people out there, we know, we know there are people out there who use drugs, some addictively, some recreationally. We know there are people out there that get into trouble. There's a lot, you know, a lot of antisocial behaviour. Um, our prisons are full of people who are there basically because they're traumatised and, yeah. you know, they took the wrong path, right? And there might be someone listening who's like, oh, that's a load of woke bullshit, in which case I don't really know why you're listening to this podcast anyway. But, you know, like, go and listen to something else. But, you know, I do believe if we want a, if we want a better world and a healthier, happier world, not just for the people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, but to the, everyone around them, their children, you know, who themselves deserve a better deserve better than that, you know? Um we know often it you know addiction is a, it's passed down from generation yeah. to generation like so i talk about this because it's out there and it's quite common yeah you know and and so and coca cocaine i think is is a really interesting one and we don't talk about that enough yeah. and cocaine use goes hand in hand with drinking and binge drinking i when i got sober when i came in i um I was quite ashamed to call myself an alcoholic because I didn't think that was cool. <laughs> I mean, that is the ridiculousness, right? And I was like, oh, I'm a drug addict. You know, like alcohol as well. I was like, well, that's like legal. Like it was a bit embarrassing, isn't it? That you can't handle that. Do you know what I mean? But for some reason I could accept that I was a cocaine addict. And I actually realized that cocaine was like... um, I only used the cocaine so I could drink more because what cocaine does is it sobers you up. Um, it does a lot of other things as well. It makes you, um, uh, I would say, sexually quite um, risky. Um, it, you know, it, it, it allows you to shed all your inhibitions. So in a way, I'm really grateful for the cocaine. And I say that. <laughs> because I think it brought me into recovery a lot quicker because when I took cocaine, my behaviour sometimes ended up, it was so dark, it was so seedy. I couldn't square what was happening with who I was. It didn't, it didn't fit with me inside, if that makes sense. It got that bad that it kind of forced the change? Yeah, and I think that like... Yeah. I mean, I, and and I think that if I, if it, like, if I hadn't discovered cocaine, I think, God, would I still be sitting in my back garden drinking now? You know, because the consequence, there were consequences, don't get me wrong. Every day I would wake up if I just, you know, and most times I was just drinking, right, in mm. the back garden by myself. Um, But the consequences were like, I, I was like, I'd have to check, oh, Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, what what have I done? Who have I sent a message? Who did I call? Uh -huh. I still have nightmares where I go, <gasps> you know, I've called someone in blackout and don't know. What still, still to this day. You <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. I mean, bringing it right back mm. just for a moment, I, I think it's really powerful the way you share because I, I absolutely, I think, you know, these things thrive in secrecy. Yeah. Um, but I think many people who, who who listen to this show will probably have a recollection of some point in their life, maybe at uni, maybe in their 20s, where they drank a bit too much alcohol and they woke up the next day, oh, what have I done? Yeah, yeah, did yeah. I, oh, God, how did I behave last night? Yeah. You know, that's not uncommon, right? No, it's not. So it's just on a completely maybe different scale. Blackout. I mean, it was like every time I drank, I blacked out because I drink so much. So cocaine sort of brought me back and allowed me to not black out. Like I wouldn't lose control, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. some people sensibly would have gone, well, just don't drink that much, Bridie. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I was an addict, an alcoholic. Um, were there other things? Like if you look back to your childhood, you know, it's striking that when you were 14, you didn't just have 
a pint of cider, you did the whole bottle. Yeah. Can you see before that there were other things where this kind of extreme type behaviour played out? Yeah, really interesting. I do now. I remember as really little things, and it's going to sound like really ridiculous, but I remember like really liking the taste of benelin. <laughs> Like, which now sounds like a lot like cowpole was too sweet I liked the sort of slightly you know I liked when I got ill because I could I could have that you know um and I remember when I was I remember when I was about 10 maybe I couldn't sleep without this is this is gonna sound so mad without having Sinex it was like a kind of vix thing because yeah. I, I thought my nose was blocked and I got it became like this kind of anxiety thing that mm. I wouldn't be able to sleep because I think I'd had a cold and so I used to use it every and it was just like a, I remember I remember thinking that the other day but it was like I couldn't yeah I couldn't let myself to settle nighttime was always a, I was really scared mm. you know and I still find myself I have to fall asleep with the light on and I don't know why it's like is it is it surrendering? Do you know what I mean? Is it? Is it that, or is it? I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't have like massive memories of my childhood, mm. and it was again. It was like all, you know, it, it was pretty normal and middle class. You know. Yeah. Um, it was fascinating in in your conversation with Gabor because obviously Gabor talks a lot about how these things have their roots in some form of childhood trauma. Mm. Not always necessarily, you know, super bad things happening, but not enough of the good things happening or not getting enough love or whatever it might have been. Mm. And you posed a question to him, which I found fascinating, that if you went in mm. and healed your childhood trauma, you sometimes wonder, well, could I go back to drinking? But mm. it would be much more responsible. Mm. Is that something you think about? <laughs> well, the very fact that my brain went there, I think is a sign that I can never drink again. What was interesting was he said, actually, you know, lots of people I know who are sober and in recovery said to me, I'm really glad you asked that question because that was what came into my head when I heard wow. him saying, you know, it's like our brain's always looking for the out. But his response to that was, well, if you healed all your trauma, why would you want to drink? which I thought was pretty, which is true, you know. Um, but do I do I think about drinking still? Is that, you know, yeah, of course I do. In the same way that I think sometimes about, like, wouldn't it be nice to be married to Brad Pitt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, because I'm a human. Again, we have thoughts, you know. What I've learned about since I got sober is to accept all of me. Mm. Like, I used to be have it you know I'd label thoughts bad and I would think that I was bad just for having them you know and there are all there are many different parts of me you know like life is not the Marvel universe more's the pity you know there aren't goodies and baddies mm. and it's like I can have bad thoughts I can have irresponsible thoughts god I'd love to get I'd love to go to the pub and get pissed or whatever that doesn't make me a bad person. Do you know right. what I mean? It's like, um, it's accepting myself and stepping back and going, would that be a good idea, Briny? You know, and, and sometimes I've, I've had to realise that it's like my brain is wired slightly wrong. So it's like, if I want to do something, I probably shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> so drink, drugs, you know, staying up a bit later, for, you know, eating crap or whatever. And if I don't want to do something, I should probably do it. So a run getting up, <laughs> you know, going to work, picking up the phone, calling someone. Yeah. We're definitely going to get to some of the practical things you've done because mm. you seem to be in a really good place these days, certainly to me. Um, I'm sure people would love to hear how you got to that place. One thing we've never really spoken about uh, on the podcast before is eating disorders. Yeah. And I do hope next year to, to cover it in more detail. Um, I know you have experienced bulimia mm -hmm. in the past. Again, a lot of people who haven't suffered don't really know what that means, mm. right? They can, I don't think mean, I don't think they do it on purpose, but it can almost, I don't think people understand it mm. unless you've been through it. Yeah. 
And I wonder if you could paint a picture of what, what it is and what does it actually look like day to day? Okay, so bulimia, I mean, God, it's so, it's addiction, really. It's just addiction, but with food, you know, that's what I see it as. Um, you know, it's a cycle of binging and purging. Um, I mean, I'm only really beginning to understand the food stuff myself now. So I, you know, haven't purged food for a very long time, you know, and I thought because I hadn't purged food for a long time, that, that was good. Now can you just be really explicit? Purge is vomiting or, yeah. you know, or using laxatives to remove it the other way. I, I didn't use that, but some people do. Um, and, but I realized, <laughs> I've certainly realized over lockdown that I would still binge on food, you know. In fact, it became like a coping mechanism in itself. You know, I, I've i only just really discovered what binge eating disorder is. And in fact, it's the most common eating disorder out there, you know. And I, I do have a theory that obesity is kind of a much as much a mental illness as it is a physical one. And I think we are so, you know, you can't cure a mental illness with shame, <laughs> You know, so I, um, I, I, I think it's it's mu eating disorders, disordered eating again are far more common than we think, and so we can go, oh, I'm you know anorexia, bulimia, that seems very alien. When in fact, a lot of us uh, get stuck in these disordered mm. eating patterns, and you know, again, you spoke earlier about you know, worshipping the wrong things. And we have a tendency, don't we, to kind of worship people who, you know, you know there's, a, there's the term of orthorexia, isn't there? Mm. Which is, you know, the clean eating stuff. Again, it's sort of disordered eating dressed up as health. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think food for me was probably one of my first addictions, you know, I remember as a child, I would like sneak raw frankfurters out of the fridge and like eat them behind a curtain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and my body has been such a sort of like, I've treated it like such a, like a you know, like a sort of theme park, I suppose, do you know what I mean? As opposed to a temple. Um... And I can still slip into that binge, bingey eating. You know, it's it's hard. Again, society is set up to kind of like push, uh, you know, junk food and stuff on us. Yeah. I, what you say about, you know, these terms, anorexia and bulimia, they can seem quite distant mm. to, to many people. But actually, if we ask ourselves honestly, how many of us can sometimes have a disordered relationship with foods? Yeah. I think it's probably more people than we might think. And I'm thinking now, you know, as we record this at the start of November, we're now, you know, about to come into the Christmas festive season, yeah, 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 yeah. right? So temptations for alcohol. Yeah. That Well, let me be more explicit. Temptations to drink more alcohol than you might usually do. Yeah. Temptations to eat more than you might ordinarily do. Do you think this time of the year is is particularly toxic is it you know in the, in the in the olden days for you is this a time of year that would would make you slip down even more have you got any advice for people what was so interesting was that december i was i'd call it amateurs month <laughs> <laughs> i can believe that because i'd be like where were you in january when i needed you you know um you know, it's like you're the status inside it. It's like, yeah, no, that's yeah, not yeah. real. Yeah, and people will be like, oh, come on, Bridie, it's Christmas. Let's go on a night out with you. And I'd be like, I'm knackered by this point. You know, actually, there's an interesting conversation, though, here about this because we are very, like, you know, we are creatures of habit, right? So Christmas, and then we go into this thing of, like, dry January. We've just had sober October. I've been thinking about this because I was, I was thinking of sort of writing about it, is that I, um, I could never do dry January. Like, it was... 
And I always felt such shame about that. You know, we, we again, we kind of make it like Christmas is the time where you have fun. January is the time where you're healthy, you know. And yeah. humans are just so much more complex than that, you know. I could get to like day January the 3rd without drinking and then I would, it would all collapse like a deck of cards and I would be full of shame because why was I not this human who could who could keep their resolutions in January, you know? Yeah. Life is just endlessly more complex and complicated than that. And I wanted to kind of write something to say to people who can't do dry January or can't do sober October uh, or actually want to kind of crawl under a duvet for Christmas because Christmas is hard because, I don't know, they're estranged from their families or their parents are dead. You know, who knows? There's a, any number yeah. of reasons, you know? Or they don't celebrate Christmas, you know, again, it's that binary thinking, isn't it? Yeah. I don't find Christmas particularly triggering <laughs> or anything like that. You know, yeah. I've I've come to sort of um I don't I just don't go to parties and things anymore. Yeah. And that's fine because I went to <laughs> a lifetime's worth of parties by the age of 37. Yeah. I don't need to do that anymore. It's interesting that one of the things that I've always liked doing with patients is when um, when appropriate, when they're ready, is to try and get them off their medication. If mm -hmm. that's what they want, if that's what the situation calls for. And if I think about some of my patients with mental health um, complaints and symptoms, if someone wanted to wean down on mm -hmm. a medication, even if they were doing well, if it was December or January, I'd often say, look, I wonder if we should just wait until it gets a bit warmer, until it's a bit lighter. Mm. I would always, um, and of course, I would never get in the way if when someone feels ready to make a change. But I always found coming into March here in the UK, as it starts to get a bit brighter, mm. spring's coming, there's a bit more hope and optimism. For me, I felt that's the time. Mm. January is dark. People are often depressed. The weather's bad. They've had Christmas. They're like in the tedium of life. It's just certainly my experience. Well, also, I think that notion of like, I will I will make this change on that date d certainly doesn't work for me as, <laughs> as an addict because then the date rolls around and I'm like, maybe I'll do it on this date, you know? Like, if you want to make the, you know... <sighs> Change happens when it's re when you need it to, and sometimes ch and, and change often happens due to great great pain. Yeah, you know, um, at, and certainly for me, that's usually how change happens. Yeah, people are ready to change when they're ready, and not a moment sooner. Yeah, I often get people saying to me, "Oh my." you know, I've got a friend who's really unwell, they drink too much, what should I, you know, how do I, how do I help? And I'm like, just let them know you love them. Yeah. But you can't, you can't lead a horse to water, or you can, or generally with the case of an alcoholic, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Yeah. So far, Bryony, we've spoken about OCD, alcohol addiction, cocaine addiction, bulimia. Yeah. Um, we've not mentioned depression yet, which you've experienced. Yeah. But as I read off those different diagnoses and, for want of a better term, labels, mm -hmm. given everything you know and that you've studied and you've experienced, the people you've spoken to, is there a common unifying cause of all of them? Um, well, I think it's, I, I, I mean, I, again, I think it's what I've come to see. I used to, at the beginning of this journey, I was very keen to be like, listen, mental health issue, depression, you know, it can be just a chemical imbalance. It can happen to anyone. You know, you don't have to have anything bad happen to you or whatever. But like, increasingly, I've realized, and I, and I, and this sort of light bulb moment happened to me in January of this year when I realised I was really, I was clinically depressed. You know, I couldn't get out of bed. And it, what was interesting about it was usually when I experienced a depressive episode, I feel like I'm the only one in the world mm -hmm. who is experiencing it. But what was so interesting about this one was that I felt like everyone 
was clinically depressed because we were coming out or we were in um, the pandemic. And actually what I realised was, and what gave me great sort of solace and comfort during that time was that the way my brain was responding was absolutely appropriate to the circumstances, right? And, And that enabled me to kind of look at when I've had them before and when, you know, and what obsessive compulsive disorder is. I always remember going away on this retreat, this great woman called Donna Lancaster, who you must have on this programme if you haven't already. And I remember her saying to me, you can let your OCD go now if you want, Bryony. It's protected you until now, but you don't need it. And I thought, what? What? And I realise now that like OCD, all of this, all addiction, all, all of these things are our brains trying to deal I essentially with a human being in a in a living their lives in a way that isn't true to themselves. Yeah. And that's it really. That's the common thread, I would say. Um and that of course makes it sound really fucking simple. It's not, no. you know, because because it's often mm. that and so but but that was what I could see I was like of course I'm depressed we've all been locked in our houses for two years you know um and and I think that's the great link between poor between all examples of poor mental health your brain's trying to protect you trying to protect you and if you listen if you listen and if you're you know again Donna she says that you know anxiety and depression are often the cure yeah. You know, they're your brain going, Oof, this isn't this isn't good for you. Now, of course, like one could look at, say, generalized anxiety disorder and say, but, but I can't. But how can I, you know, but this is making me anxious about little things like getting on a train and you can go, well, I can't just not get on the train. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's but it's bigger than that. You know, yeah. it's like the train isn't the problem. There's something else probably going on in your life and it's it's manifesting itself in that i mean th- this is certainly where where i'm ending up you know 21 years you know in i've seen tens of thousands of patients right i'm also coming to and have been coming to this conclusion more and more that you know for, for all the uh great things that we do in modern medicine i do think one of the um the more damaging consequences and un- I would say unintended consequence a lot of the time is that we we label things as separate. Mm. And um, I personally am moving away from labels because I find that people can often then start to identify with those labels. Yeah. I appreciate sometimes mm. that can be helpful. A lot of the time I found it's, oh, no, that's why I've got this. You know, I'm, I'm um, you know, my mum had this. I've got X or I've got Y, I've got Z. And sure, that might be great in the short term to go, oh, you know, I'm not making this up. It's like that there's there, this is something. But it can also be hard, particularly if the language we use around it makes it your identity, you know, it makes it very hard to then break free. But a lot of the time, these symptoms are, you know, if we pay attention, they're telling us something. Mm. Right? But but modern life is so quick and fast paced, and we don't need to sit with our thoughts and listen to these signals anymore, do we? We can just numb them with whatever, alcohol, food. Deliveroo. Deliveroo. Social media. Social media, you know, WhatsApp message, whatever it might be, you don't have to sit with your thoughts anymore. You don't have to pay attention, but our bodies are speaking to us. Mm. They're they're trying to tell us something, you know, can we we listen? Can we hear it? Mm. You know, Yes, on, on, on one hand, it sounds simple. No, it's simple at its core, but it's not easy. You it's know? not easy because the world is not set up for us to live healthy, happy lives, I don't think. Um you know, it, it, you know, it, in what how we what we value as success. I oh, I'm going really woo woo here now, okay. But I feel that what we are experiencing right now globally on a sort of you know all of the stuff of uh, you know cost of living crisis, gas shortage, you know, like all all of this stuff, um, turmoil in political systems. All of this stuff to me is like, if you listen, what what are we being told? 
the, none of this, this way we living our lives does not work. Yeah. It just doesn't. You know, we can't, you know, great. You look back at the, I don't know, the 90s and go, wow, all that, you know, that boom and no bust. And, but it, it's not, it's not really sustainable. And I, and I don't, I don't think we're designed as humans. For, you know, convenience feels great, but I don't, it, you know, <laughs> I don't think it's a kind of, it isn't a sustainable way in which to live our lives. Um, you know, I often say uh, my other definition of an of what one of the great quality great one of the defining qualities of my addiction or of addiction generally is wanting to go from A to Z without going through B C D E F G H I J K. It's like just get me to Z, but I don't want to do any of the fucking work to get there. So that manifested my addiction of like I just want to feel good. Yeah, you know, I just need to feel good. So give me a drink, give me a line, give me a you know, or food, or you know, oh, I don't want to feel this feeling, so I'm gonna play Candy Crush or whatever. You know, there's a, there's a there's a million ways, you know, but the feelings are there for a reason. Yeah. You know, you go through them, you tend to feel a lot better at the end of them. But all of us, I kind of feel we're kind of loads of bodies sort of suppressing yeah. so much because we've been taught that that's the right thing to do. And in fact, it's it's wrong. No yeah. wonder we're all ill. It starts early, I think. You know, it's very hard to pinpoint exact moments, but that inauthenticity that you spoke about... I won't, I won't labour this because I've mentioned this on the show before, but as things stand, I can pinpoint it for me to maybe when I was six or seven when um, I developed the impression, uh, I'm not blaming my parents for this, to be really clear, I think they were just trying to help me and support me and me to be the best that I could be. But I really developed the impression that I'm only loved and worth something if I'm top of the class or I've mm -hmm. got full marks. Again, we, we, I've, I've unpicked this before in the show, so I'm not, I'm not going to go into it all in detail, but essentially I think that was a key moment for me where I realised, not even consciously, that I have to change who I am in order to be accepted. Yeah. And I think I can pretty much relate every problematic pattern in my life, on some level, I can relate it back to who you are is not enough. You have to change who you are in mm. order to be enough. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think it's that dissimilar for most people. No. Right? Did you, do you know any, can you think of any of those pinpoint moments? Yeah, well, I also think it's like, and again, I don't blame my parents at all. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're like lovely people. And and that thing of like, well, they were literally doing their best. Yeah, just as know, we are with our just kids. Just as I am. But I do, yeah, definitely that thing of if you're, six, you know, you need to be successful, you need to do well at this. But also I was thinking it's those little things that I catch myself doing and I have to stop myself doing, which is like when my daughter cries, I'm like, don't cry. <laughs> Or, you know, she gets angry about, or someone gets angry about something, or, uh, you know, ch a child gets angry about something, we tend to go, don't be silly. Mm -hmm. And and we're, you know, it. I certainly think that my quest for happy has sort of made me fundamentally really unhappy because what happy obviously is brilliant, it's great, you know, but it's not realistic all of the time. And, and yet we've been taught that it's like the only valid emotion, mm -hmm. you know? And and so when we feel anything else, we feel like we're failing in some way. Well, that's just not true, you know. What have you learnt in recovery mm -hmm. that has fundamentally changed the way you parent? That children are not extensions of us. I think that, you know... I think in society, we're like, oh, our children, they're like mini me. You know, they're like little versions of us. And we always ask that question, don't we? You know, how does how does your child, oh, you know, take after the mum and how do they take yeah. after the dad or whatever? And what I'm more interested in is how my daughter is just herself. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, but recovery has also taught me that I can't... I can't control anything, you know. I can't control anything. I can do my best and I can be there. Um, but I don't know what the future is going to hold. 
I've only got now. We've only got now, you know. Um, and so just enjoy it, make the most of it. Yeah. I think <laughs> sounds really cheesy and that's okay. Cheese is good, right? Um, Cheese and cliches are always good. Yeah, you get yeah, older, yeah. you like, there's a, there's yeah, a lot of truth to this cliche. Yeah, well, that's why it's a cliche. Um, so I think that's probably the main... Uh, t- and, and to allow my daughter to feel her feelings. Yeah. It's hard though, isn't it, sometimes? Because you fall into that pattern or you think, oh, that's what my mum said to me. And before you know it, you've repeated it. Yeah. But I think even... I certainly think we shouldn't be beating ourselves up about it. Just even having that awareness to go... Okay, next time that happens, I'm not. I'm going to try not to respond in that way. Yeah. Even that, I think, is one of the most helpful things for me as a parent is not beating myself up and just going, yeah, you know what, you could have handled that better. Also, next time, I will try to. And also maybe owning it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> because and then, telling them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. then they're like, oh, look, my parents made mistakes and it was fine and we move on. You yeah. know, we go again. <laughs> You're well known for running marathons, right? (laughs) And you you really are. Like, imagine someone told you that at 20, you'd be a... (laughs) But but what I find fascinating about that is, and maybe this fits in with this kind of extreme uh, (laughs) nature. It's like, I don't know how physically active you were prior to running marathons. Maybe Mm -hmm. you could elaborate on that. Not at all. So... (laughs) Again, there's a pattern, isn't there? To go from not being physically active to going all in to doing 26.1, 26.2, I should know by now. 26.2. 26.2 miles. It seems quite a big leap. Yeah. I'd love to hear about your experiences. Why did you start running a marathon? <laughs> Why did you do it in your underwear? Yeah. And having personally had my own life changed from being challenged to do a marathon the London Marathon, um, I actually think pretty much anyone can probably do it, even though they don't think that. Well, yeah, I mean, if we were, I remember someone saying to me, if we were to say, um, you know, our child is 26.2 miles away right now in need of help, we'd get up and we'd go and get, you know, if we had to walk or run there, we would. Um, I ended up, the story of how I ended up signing up to do a marathon is like, I'd like to say it was kind of out of the goodness of my heart and to better myself. But I got invited along to the launch of Heads Together, which was the Duke, uh, sorry, the Prince and Princess of Wales's mental health thing, which uh, campaign, which they did with, with Prince Harry. And it was 2016. And I was invited along to the launch of it as someone who was talking in the press about them, uh, you know, mental health. And I got introduced to the Princess of Wales, then the Duchess of Cambridge. And um, I like your name dropping here. It's yeah, good. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm good. Very I'm impressive. Good. I'm good at like I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she and she said uh, she was talking about how Heads Together were going to be the official charity of the London Marathon in 2017. And I said to her, are you going to do the marathon? And she said, oh, no, I can't, you know, security and all that. Because it's quite difficult to secure 26.2 miles, right? And I went, well, if I can do a marathon, you can. And I was like, I don't know why I've said that. Because I, like, I've never done a marathon. I've, like, eaten a marathon. That was it, you know, before they got changed and their name to Snickers. And and then the guy standing next to her from Heads Together was like, you're going to do the marathon then? And I was like, I'm going to do the marathon, I guess. So I signed up and... I guess also part of me was like, if I do this marathon, maybe I'll stop drinking so much. So just paint us a picture. Uh, where were you at that time in your life? You know, you're, you're successful, you're an author, you're mm. a journalist, but you are a full-on alcoholic at that time? Yeah, I mean, but like, you know, what the word functioning alcoholic. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't drinking that morning, but I remember I'd had to take a diazepam to get myself on the train to Stratford to, to this event. Yeah. So you get chat. So before you know it, people are talking about you doing the marathon, and what mm. you just say, yeah, okay, then. Yeah, okay, because I like a challenge. Yeah. Um, and then I, I thought also, I thought, oh, maybe this will, maybe this will help you cut down your drinking, you know. And it didn't. Um, I actually, it was quite kind of shocking because I remember I'd go out and do like a ten mile training run on a Sunday, and then I'd like drink ten pints. You know, to celebrate after. Yeah, it was like 
total and I and I you know I loved that mar- that first marathon I did I think because I knew at the finish line there was a bender waiting for me mm-hmm. not a medal a bender <laughs> you know which I, I duly went on um but actually what that marathon did and what running did for me was it taught me a couple of things First of all, that my body was capable of way more than I've ever given it credit for, right? It could do amazing things. And every weekend it could do a little more than I thought it could the weekend before. But also that there was this like totally different way of living my life. There was another another option. I was like, oh my God. I remember, um, I, I was like, look at all these people like getting up on a Sunday morning and running, you know, <laughs> I, could, I couldn't believe it. Wow. And... I really loved it. I felt so good. And so I don't think there's, it's not, it's no mistake that I finished the London Marathon, went on a bender and literally crashed into rehab quite soon afterwards, you know. But then the funny thing was I did, I then did my next London Marathon in 2018 and I was like coming up, well, maybe I was just over six months sober. I can't remember. And that was the one in the underwear, uh, which was a kind of, because I discovered you know, I was like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm a curvy lady and I can run a marathon, you know, because I just it hadn't occurred to me that I could. Yeah. So I wanted to show to other curvy ladies, look, look what's possible, hence running in my pants. <laughs> and um, anyway, hands down, that was the worst. I thought it was going to be, I thought it was going to be so much easier because I was sober. You know, I'm like, I'm healthier. It was absolutely fucking appalling. I hated every moment of it. And I realised that was the power of alcohol in my life, that I had literally, it had fired me through 26.2 miles with a smile on my face because I knew there was beer at the end of it. And without it there, I was like, what am I doing? It was also like, do you ever have those dreams where you're being made to redo your like GCSEs, your A-levels? but you haven't revised. I don't have those ones. I have other ones, but not those ones. Oh, I have that. And I'm like, but why are you making, but hang on, why am I doing this? I'm like 42. And it was like that because the year before had been so much fun. And I was like, why am I doing this again? Uh, So yes, that was, that was, that was an interesting lesson. You you said that one of the big lessons you learned after the end of the first one was that, wow, my body is capable of doing so much more than I thought. Mm. Why is that such an important lesson to learn? Well, because our bodies are our homes, you know? I I, I often get asked, like, one of the things that people say to me a lot on Instagram, I do a lot of posts of, like, on the beach uh, in my bikinis, and I'm, like, a size 18 to 20 or whatever. Um I jump in the pool, you know, I jump in the sea in the in the in the winter or whatever. And people say to me, God, I wish I had your confidence. Right. And I'm like, I don't have confidence. Confidence is a trick. Yeah. It's a total trick. Like no one really has confidence. But what I don't, what I do have is a desire not to hate on my body anymore. Because it's just a waste of time. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of my energy. It's a waste of everybody else's energy. It genuinely is one of the few things in life that makes me really angry is is diet culture, I guess, and how many women have been sort of, um, I guess, you know, how many of us have been, it's like a cult almost, you know, have, have grown up just it never occurring to us that we could like ourselves. Like the default position was you can be better. You should be better. You are not enough or you are too much. That is what most women grow up with. Most women my age, and I, you know, I can only speak, have gone through their whole lives thinking that. Watching their own parents who have watched their parents who have watched their parents, you know, um, trying to shrink themselves to be a better mm. or, you know, just change themselves to be better. And that's just, it's its mad. It's totally mad. And I, you know, I, I don't, I don't really care what size someone is anymore. You know, I think we can, we've, we've veered from one point to another. It was, 
you know, there's been a big thing going all around social media, which was the New York Post had put a piece up with a headline that said heroin chic is back. Yeah. And people getting furious about it, which is, you know, again, I don't really have the energy to do it. You know, again, actually, if you read the piece, it was a little bit more nuanced than that, but it was irresponsible, the headline. Right. But, um, you know, that idea that women's bodies are somehow trendy. You know, people will say to me, oh, my God, cur you know, but curves are amazing. They're so in trend. And I'm like, me, I'm just, this is me. This is what I look like. This is just what I look like. Like, I'm not, you know, I don't, you know, and I had a bit of a reminder of it this morning. I was at Euston Station and I was having my coffee and a guy came up to me and he said to me, and it was quite shocked. And he said to me, how much will it cost me to take to have you? It was and it was like 7.30 in the morning as well. Do you know what I mean? He just came up to you and said yeah, that. Yeah, he was like out of it. He was clearly, you know, he was and I was like, I just went, mate. He was he was obviously really unwell. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because he but I thought, my God, that but I suddenly was jolted because I used to get shit like that all the time. When I was in my teens and my 20s, like before I was even, when I was like 12, 13, I used to get men coming up to me and seeing me as like, pub, you know, like my body as public property or whatever. And that is, that's not unusual. Do you know what I mean? Like the things like men who are, you know, now we would be like, that's out of, that's insane. Oh, that gives me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. My daughter's about to be 10 and you're saying that at 12. Like yeah, that literally. I remember sitting in my mum, I remember my mum popping in to the bank one day and I was sitting in the passenger seat waiting for her. And uh ticket uh ticket inspector like a, 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 a what are they called like a road traffic he came uh, up and i thought oh he's going to issue us parking attendant parking attendant <laughs> he's going to issue us with a parking ticket and i better oh i was like mom mom and i was like 12 and he was like can i have your number I mean, that is shocking. But that's but that was like that was like the eighties, the nineties, and it was probably the seventies, the sixties, the fifties, you know. And I so like and I I played along with it like for so long, you know, I had to shrink myself. I was like, I, you know, I will be worthy if this person finds me attractive, if this man finds me attractive, you know. I've got massive boobs, you know. I was, I have sexualized myself from the moment I knew how to, you know, and 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 it and it was like I willingly played a part in that. And then what happened was, you know, and I started to stop paying that part in it definitely when I got pregnant, you know. So we can look in binary again of like, well, I was really unwell. I was full-blown alcoholic. But I had definitely got this awareness that this was not right. And I was not going to kind of like play this part anymore because I'd, I'd suddenly my body as well had done this amazing thing. And I yeah. had this other, you know, so it was, and it was like, I don't want my daughter to grow up in yeah. that world where that's the case. We say you, you were willingly playing a role in that, but I don't know, from the outside, and this kind of fits with other themes that we've been talking about today, you're just a kid, mm. right, when this sort of stuff's starting to happen. So just as with, you know, a lot of things that happen in our childhoods, these things start off as defensive mechanisms to help us get through and survive in, you know, a very toxic mm. culture and a toxic environment. So you know, is it fair to say you're playing a part? Yeah, I guess technically you're playing a part, but it's but it's probably your subconscious trying oh, to go, I need to, yeah, this I is a way to insulate myself. I, I, need to I don't judge myself or, yeah. um, or shame myself for that. What I mean to say is that it is so insidious, this shit, do you know what I mean? That like... We don't even know that we're doing, you know, that, it, that it's, we, we, we think that we want to be part of it a lot of the time. Do you think men like me, right? Um, do you think, do you think, well, number one, we've just got no idea about this stuff because we're men. So potentially we haven't experienced it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm interested as to, you know, do you think this is changing? Is it getting better? Do you, do you like when you do this, um, when you did the marathon in your underwear? Yeah. 
I'm guessing there was a lot of positivity. It was most, it was 99.9%. But I imagine there was some... Well, the only thing, the only thing, the only negative thing that we encountered, I, I mean, I, you know, I like, um, was uh, someone, a newspaper columnist wrote a column about how it was sad that we were sexualizing ourselves. And I was like, you've missed the point entirely of this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like, this It was not, se- you know, it was like, this is my body, you know, and this is what my body looks like. You know, um, and I know women in the public eye get this way more than men, but the sort of things people will say publicly or on DMs, I mean, oh my god! I mean, I get, I get, I get a lot of DMs from men who are like, they uh, say um, things that are like, I can't repeat on a on a on your podcast. How do you deal with that? What does that do to um, your psyche? Given where you are these days, I tend to sort of like roll my eyes now, but sometimes. Like I, a, a, earlier this year, I had someone set up an account which was like, I love Bryony Gordon's fat tits. And it was just pictures. They'd taken pictures from my, um, from my Instagram. And it was like, I, it upset me because I was like, mm. that isn't what this is about. And it's not, this isn't your space. You know, I get really annoyed on Instagram when men send me messages propositioning me or telling me that they think I'm really good looking or whatever. I'm like, that is not the point and this is not for you. There are plenty of places on the internet <laughs> that are for you and that cater to this. This is not one of them. Mm-hmm. This is for other women like me who, because of those places on the internet, mm-hmm. feel, you know, insecure and, and, and insignificant and not enough or too much again, you know. Um, that's what my want my Instagram to be is like, and that is actually what my entire career has been, and all the books I've written is like I felt really bad and ashamed about this, and it, and I know I can't be the only one who feels it, but I haven't met anyone who's admitted to doing it. So if I put my hand up mm. <laughs> and I say this is how I feel and this is how my brain works, and if you were also feel this way come and we can hang out and yeah. it's like uh, and we can realize we're not mad or we are mad but we're not bad yeah. well i think what you've what you've done really is incredible Bryony, because i think your honesty your vulnerability the way you share i think you know brings people towards you and i think other women or even other men who feel or have felt those kinds of emotions, I think it helps them feel less alone. It's like, oh, wow. And a lot of people won't have the courage or what they perceive as the courage to share like you share. Mm. They, they just don't. And, you know, I, what, you know, certainly one of the things I've massively learned from years of seeing patients is that when a patient knows that there's other people like them, like when I say to someone in the afternoon, oh, you're the fourth person today, I've seen with symptoms like that, the relief. Yeah, shoulders go down. It's like, yeah, they just, oh, I'm not the only one. Oh, there's other people mm. who also feel this way. You know, so I think it's very, very powerful. Um, the other thing you said about the marathon there, which was really interesting for me, is that by training for the marathon, you suddenly start to experience a parallel world that was going <laughs> on the entire time where you were partying and mm. boozing that you weren't aware of. Mm. And it, it's almost as if you needed that um, that jolt to maybe doing the local park run, the 5K yeah. wouldn't have been enough. Maybe you had to go all in to 26.2 miles mm. to sort of get that jolt. So what I'm interested in, Bryony, there'll be, I know many people heard my, my chat with you from the London Marathon and have entered the ballot, got a place. I know some people have done it on the back of getting inspired by hearing uh, the stories of people doing the doing the marathon, but some people will also think, "Oh, it's not for me." I, you know, what do they say? You will have heard this as well. Oh, I could never do that. Mm. You know that's untrue. I know that's untrue. Um, you you could absolutely do that. So for someone who's sort of semi inspired by hearing what you have done, Bryony, and wants to think, well, maybe I should do a challenge. Maybe I should move my body more. 
why would you encourage them to sign up, let's say, for something like a marathon? Okay, so for me, exercise is all about the reasons why you're doing it, right? If you're signing up to do a marathon and you think you have to be the fastest or the thinnest or the strongest or, you know, whatever, then you're more likely to fail at it or to, to not, you know, like those were the reasons... I don't know. Growing up in Britain, that was what exercise was about. It was about punishing yourself. You know, there was this notion. It was about for as a woman, it was about shrinking myself, right? And when I started exercising for the growth, <laughs> rather than the shrinking properties of it, that was when it kind of turned on its head for me. So it wasn't about making myself smaller. It was about the clarity it gave me, the space, the the endorphins, you know, um, the time outside. I also think people get obsessed about timing and things like that with marathons. Mm -hmm. After I did my first marathon, people would come up to me and be like, what was your time? And I'd be like, well, what was your time? And they'd say, oh, I haven't done a marathon. And I'd say, okay, well, shut up then. Do you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter. You know, it really doesn't matter. I did a triathlon a couple of years ago and I came second to last, you know. Who cares? I did it, you know. Yeah. And um, so for me, it's like, why are you doing this? Because exercise for me is, it's not about making myself look better. It's about making myself feel better. So, um, and I think once you start doing that, uh, it, it changes everything. The other thing I would say is I had this notion that like whenever I saw someone exercising, I'd be like, they all woke up and went, yay, woohoo, I really want to go for, a, I really want to go for a run today. And what I would say is nobody wakes up wanting to go for a run, but nobody regrets going for one. And that's what gets me out of bed most days to do some form of exercise, if not running jumping in my local Lido, which I which I started doing, um, strength training, that kind of thing. So I'm probably, uh, that's the other ir ironic thing is I'm a size 18 to 20, you know, by all popular metrics, I'm unhealthy, I'm obese or whatever. And yet I am the healthiest I've ever been in my life. You know, I run three times a week. I swim in an ice cold Lido three times a week. I strength train twice a week, you know, and it's all, it's all for my head. Yeah. Very, very powerful. Do you ever think about weight and losing weight anymore? Or is that yeah. sort of... No, I do. You I do. totally do. Yeah. No, I have to be honest about that. I do. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting to me. What do you mean you have uh, to be honest? I Well, because I think people think, they look at me and they think I'm like totally cool in my own body and stuff like that. And as I've said, that's not the case. I, I have issues with it the whole time. But I need to take a stand with it, you know, mm. and I'm like, I'm not going to shrink myself. That won't make me feel better in the long mm. run. I mean, I eat pretty healthily now. I exercise, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I occasionally binge, nothing like I used to. Um, and when you do binge now. Yeah, I'm really mindful of it. Yeah, you're aware of it. Yeah. And what's the voice in your head like the day after? It's like, why are you doing that to yourself, babes? And what did it used to be? Uh, oh, you awful, awful piece of shit. How, look how disgusting you are. Yeah, this is really important because it's not, again, it's not binary, black or white. You're, yeah. you're either doing it all the time or you're never doing it. It's like, well, no, there's kind of a continuum here. And yeah. some days when life's not going well, we're tired, we've not slept, we've taken on too much. That's often when our kind of underlying tendencies or patterns start to come yeah, out yeah, again, yeah. don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, um, it's a jolt back to, but I definitely, I sort of have to assume that this is broadly speaking the weight that I'm supposed to be, mm. do you know what I mean? And, and I have been, like when I've been my thinnest or healthiest BMI, let me tell you, Rangan, I have not been healthy. That yeah. has been cocaine, alcohol, living on a diet of fucking quavers, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I have my vices still. Do you know what I mean? I like the, a, a little cigarette every now and then. I shouldn't. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> hey, you're just telling the truth, aren't you? Um, but broadly speaking, I try to look after myself because yeah. this is all I've got. On the subject of looking after ourselves, to sort of bring this conversation to a close, in terms of practical things, I know that the books outline loads of them, plenty of stuff in there we've not even touched on, um, but. You have been in the public domain talking about mental health and well-being for many years now. From what you've learned, 
with your own life, from hearing the stories of other people, what are kind of some of these things that you and other people have found helpful when trying to improve their mental well-being? Um, definitely not isolate, like don't isolate. Um, our brains want us to isolate. Um, and that's, if you are suffering from a mental health issue, that's how the mental is health issue gets its purchase on you, so to speak. So, um, do the thing that you don't want to do. That's go out, pick up the phone, call someone, um, be around people. Uh, I think that for me is, is the biggest thing is the constant battle I have still. And, you know, sometimes it's just all the time of like motivating myself to leave my bed. You know, that's, that's the baseline truth is that that is sometimes like my, my brain feels like a kind of, it's like there's a war going on in it, you know, and I think that's what it's like when you uh, ten have a tendency towards depression. So, but I, what I have found is that the more that I force myself out and do the opposite of what my brain asked me to do, mm. the better I feel. For, for that person who's listening right now, Bryony, who is saying that that's me, I am struggling. It's getting darker. It's getting colder. I'm not good in winter. The morning comes, I'm stuck in my bedroom. I don't want to get out of bed. I hear what you're saying, Bryony, but I just I just want to pull the covers up and stay here. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd say to that person? Okay, I'd say, okay then, babe, stay there. Don't be hard on yourself, though, because I bet you if you stay there, you're going to be hard on yourself for staying there. <laughs> so if you're going to do it, do it and do it and do it like and just go for it. Like get the Netflix on, look after yourselves, start nourishing, you know, th see it as a nourishing yeah. thing. Um, but if you're going to spend time in that bed beating yourself up for why you're not out doing all the other things, scrolling through Instagram, then mate, just it. get out, get out, just try it. Just try it. Go downstairs, yeah. open the front door. You don't have to go far. And let me tell you, your bed will still be there when you come back. Your bed is always there. If you're lucky, you have a bed, right? Yeah. Um, and so that would be what I'd say. Just try it for me. Please just try it for me and see, see if you feel a little bit different. Not like yeah. massively. You know, you're not going to be cured by going outside, but just take a deep breath and walk around the block. Yeah. One of the bits I loved in the book was the part about small acts of service. Yeah. And in particular, when you wrote, and when you are picking up your flatmate's dirty clothes and putting them in the washing basket thinking, what is the point of life? You can acknowledge that this is the point of life. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really, really powerful. Can you elaborate on what exactly you meant by that? So I don't know about you, but I can often get really resentful uh, as I'm going around the house picking up my husband's clothes or um, cleaning up after my daughter or, uh, or when people ask me to do things. I'm like, oh, God, I'm really busy. Can't you see how busy I am? I'm a really important, busy person. I don't want to, I don't want to, I just want to be in my bed. I just want to be in my bed. And um, actually, when I turn it around and go, oh, how lucky am I that this is that these people are in my life, that they're asking me things, I feel a lot better. The other thing, someone told me this once, okay, I went on this, um, this amazing place called the Body Camp in Ibiza, which is really fun exercise <laughs> for your head, not your body kind of thing, not your, you know, for, your, for the way it makes you feel, not the way it makes you look. And I went, I went on this, this place and there was, there was someone there who completely spent the whole time telling me that there was another person on the retreat. They spent the whole time telling me that my squats were wrong, that my lunges were wrong. They were like, oh no, you, you've got it slightly, you know, your hips too turned out there, Brian. And I, I was like, fuck off. But I didn't want to say it. So I just seethed with resentment and I eventually let this out to another woman who was on the retreat. And she said, Brian, you just see it as doing service. And I said, what? Said, this person or obviously always need someone to be patronising and condescending. Today, this week, you're that person. Just be it for them. Just smile and wave and see it as doing service to them. And I was like, 
and that completely through. So now if someone I work with or someone in my family is calling me up and whinging and doing the thing, you know, to press, trying to press the buttons, I just smile and I'm like, I am doing service here. This person obviously, you know, it's like if you go into a, I don't know, you go you're you're on a train station and someone is rude to, you know someone yeah. budges past you was rude to you and you're like how fucking dare they <laughs> or you're driving and someone cuts you up and you're like that person's just an art just that person is in a rush and yeah. they're really difficult you know and they're probably not having that good a time just let it be it, it is so powerful that it really is it's just changing our perspective mm. and knowing that we get to choose our perspective. Yeah. Right? You can say, well, why should I? Why, what's that going to do for you? It does nothing. It just causes resentment, frustration. But you literally can choose to be a different person in those moments. I know it sounds really, oh yeah, sounds all nice. But but it it genuinely works. It makes life so much easier. Yeah. Like, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. Try it. I would challenge some just seven days, it. try it. Yeah. I don't know, one day. Just try it all day for one day. And just see how you feel. Because I kind of, I also realise I've spent a lot of my time addicted to my own drama, you know, to this need for there to be chaos in my life. And I can sort of find, try and find ways to kind of, you know, seek that out on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, one of the acts of service, that's one of the things, you know, I, as an alcoholic, I use the 12 steps and I, I love it and it has helped me so much. And, but one of the key uh, tenets of that is service. Uh, you only keep, I, I mean, there's all sort of anonymity. I probably shouldn't be saying all of this, but you only keep what you have by giving it away. <laughs> and that's really powerful to me. And I always remember hearing someone who was a drug addict in recovery. And I always remember them saying to me that, and I put this in the book, that they found it um, uh, really, really hard to feel useless when they were being useful and being useful doesn't have to be a massive thing. It's not handing over a cheque for a million pounds to a charity, you know. It can be literally turning to your flatmate and saying, do you want a cup of tea? Or, you know, asking someone how they are or just smiling at someone at the supermarket checkout, you know. Yeah. I love that. You keep what you have by giving it away. So, so powerful. It's not mine. It's a 12-step thing. But, it, but it's a really, really powerful line. It's what you're doing here with this podcast. Yeah, I never thought about it like that before. It's an act of service. Think of all the people that listen to, like, oh, you've helped me so much with your podcasts. Like, this is stuff that when you're in, when you're in this working environment, you can kind of think that it must be sort of really intuitive to people. Mm -hmm. But it's not. No. It wasn't intuitive to me, you know, even five years ago. Um, and you mentioned your curiosity and curiosity is the best thing because we learn things mm -hmm. all the time. And the one thing, the biggest thing I've learned from being in recovery and doing all of this mental health work, the biggest thing I've learned is that I know very little yeah. <laughs> and I don't know what's going to happen on the train back today or tomorrow. I have no control over it. I don't know what life is going to throw at us. You know, I don't know. And everything I think, like I used to, I guess I'll sort of, you know, finishing up. But like I, my thing used to be that I always used to think I was going to feel the way I felt at that time forever, you know, and the way I felt was usually shit or depressed and I couldn't see a way past it. And what I've realised is that the way I'm feeling right now can be, it can change massively this afternoon, tomorrow, mm. something, a fixed view I have on something political, something in the news could be completely different in three weeks time. And there will be something I'm doing right now that is massively unhealthy that in two years time, I'll look back and go, I can't believe I used to do that. Yeah. If I'm lucky. Yeah. Brian, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for coming to the studio. This is a, a wonderful book for people. No such thing as normal, a practical guide to mental health and uh, a safe and uneventful trip back to London. Thank you, Rangan. 
If you enjoyed that conversation, I think you are really going to enjoy this one on how changing your relationship with alcohol may transform your life. It's the one thing that no one ever really questions. They question their diet and they question their meditation. They question the way they move their body and they sort of forget to actually look at this thing underneath, which is alcohol that's tripping people up.